All right, take a look at this uh, review of economics. You have here macroeconomics. You have eight, nine, nine topics in macroeconomics. <coughs> macroeconomics have nine topics in microeconomics. We're going to can you get one of these now. No. Uh, all right. So, okay. So you have nine topics in microeconomics. We're going to attempt to do as many as we can. Uh, let's see if we don't reach everything. Uh, we'll deal with that later. Um, we're going to do first, we're going to do the first two topics in macroeconomics, limited resources and production possibility curve. Then we're going to skip down to microeconomics one, one, two, and um, <coughs> one, two, and possibly maybe even three and four. And then we'll go back to macroeconomics, okay? I just pull it out. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, it's got one of be standing up. Okay, so uh, so first we're going to do limited resources and production possibility curve. Uh, I, I'm going to be going quickly, and I hope that most of you have some familiarity with this already, so you understand what I'm doing because I'm going to be going very quickly. Okay, limited resources. Goods and services are limited. Goods and services are scarce. Uh, All right. Goods and services are limited. Goods and services are scarce. Goods and services are scarce. Goods and services are limited. Goods and services are scarce. Scarce means there aren't enough of them. Scarce means there aren't enough of them. And it also means, it also means there will never be enough of them. It means there aren't enough of them, and there never will be enough of them. There never will be enough of them. In other words, you'll never have enough goods and services to go around. Now the question here is this. I understand maybe today that there aren't enough of them. But how do I know there will never be enough of them? How do I know that it'll, never, it'll, it'll always be the case there won't be enough goods and services to go around? In other words, maybe we will become so productive that there'll be enough. How do you know there'll never be enough? Well, the answer is, the answer to that question is that it is not a lack in the productivity. It is the fact that no matter how much you give a person, he always wants more. No matter how much you give a person, he always wants more. Therefore, goods and services are and always will be scarce. There won't, there aren't enough of the goods and services to go around. And if there aren't, en if there aren't enough to satisfy everybody's wants, if there aren't enough to satisfy everybody's wants, we have to economize. Economize means to try to squeeze out the most we can out of the resources we have. Try to squeeze out the most we can out of the resources we have. So economics concerns itself with how we allocate scarce resources to uh, produce the maximum possible. That's what economics is about. In other words, if there were enough to go around, you wouldn't have to worry about economics. It's as simple as that. Okay, now we draw here a thing we call the production possibility curve. We draw here this thing we call the production possibility curve. On this axis, on the vertical axis, we have guns. And on the horizontal axis, we have butter. And guns does not mean guns, and butter does not mean butter. Guns means, guns means military goods, and butter means consumer goods. Consumer goods. That's what butter means. Butter means consumer goods. In other words, guns and butter are only an example for the goods that we have. An example. In other words, what we're doing here basically is not the case that we necessarily, all we're trying to do 
is split the goods in society into two sections. I'm trying to split the goods in society into two sections. Military goods and consumer goods. We could have split the goods in society into any two sections we chose. In other words, it doesn't necessarily have to be military goods and civilian goods. We could have split it into goods and services. Real goods and services. We could have split it that way. Whatever it is. Traditionally, the way it's been done in economics, we split it into military goods and civilian goods. And what the production possibility curve is showing is that society has the resources to produce a maximum of any of these points along the production possibility curve. Society has the resources to produce a maximum of any of the points along the production possibility curve. Not outside. In other words, you can't be outside the production possibility curve. We don't have enough resources to be outside the production possibility curve. You can, however, be inside the production possibility curve. You can be inside the production possibility curve, but it's not good to be inside the production possibility curve. Not good. Not good because if you are inside the production possibility curve, you are not at full employment. In other words, if you're producing at a point inside the production possibility curve, if you're only producing that much good, that much guns, and that much butter, what you're doing is you're leaving some of your resources not working. Some of your resources are not working. Some of your land isn't working, some of your labor isn't working, some of your capital isn't working. Something is not producing. It's just sitting there doing nothing. And it's not being saved for the future either. It's just sitting there being nothing, doing nothing. So if you're inside the production possibility curve, it's an inefficient point. Inefficient in the sense is that you could do better. With the resources you have, you could be here or here or here or here or somewhere on the production possibility curve. At least choose to be somewhere on the production possibility curve because by being inside, you're not accomplishing that. So that's the principle that the production possibility curve wants to emphasize. The principle of the production possibility curve wants to emphasize the fact that Society has the resources to produce this maximum. They should produce somewhere along the production possibility. Because if not, you're just wasting resources. Where you choose to produce is a matter of your choice. You choose any one of those points. No one, as far as economics is concerned, no one is telling you to produce more guns and less butter or more butter and less guns. It's simply a matter of choice from an economic standpoint. Uh, it, it's, it's not relevant. Okay. Now, the next question we have to answer in terms of the production possibility curve is why is the production possibility curve curved? Why is the production possibility curve curved? Why isn't it a straight line? Why isn't it a straight line? In other words, something like this. Well, what does it mean to be a straight line? What it means to be a straight line is that, for example, in this straight line, Two guns, one butter, two guns, one butter, two guns, one butter, two guns, one butter. Meaning, every time you give up a gun, you can add one butter. Next time you give up a, two guns, you can add a butter. Next time you give up two guns, you can add a butter. Every time, from here all the way down the curve. In other words, the slope is constant. The rate at which you can trade guns for butter is constant. That's what a straight line means. Here, what it means is, the first time you gave up a gun, you were able to add this many butter, a lot. And the second time you gave up a gun, you're only able to add this much butter. And the third time, even less than that. In other words, the slope is changing. The slope is changing. And the same on the bottom part. First time you gave up a butter, you were able to add that many guns, and the second time fewer guns, and the third time fewer guns. That's the question. The question is, how come the first time you gave up one of the resources, you were able to add a lot of the other one, and the second time fewer, and the third time fewer, and so on? How come that happens? And the answer to that question is, the answer to that question is as follows. Assuming, 
and it's a good assumption to make, assuming that um, these two goods, these two categories of goods, have different factor inputs. It's a good assumption to make because if they didn't have different factor inputs, they would be the same good. So they must have different factor inputs. So let's assume that guns are what we call capital intensive and butter is what we call labor intensive. In other words, guns needs more capital to produce it, more machines, and butter needs more workers. Assume that's the case. Now, if you're all the way on top of the curve, all the way on top of the curve by the guns, all those guns, and producing zero butter, You've, act, you, you've obviously chosen to have only guns. So you are putting all your resources into gun production. All your capital resources into gun production and all your labor resources into gun production. Everything. In other words, even the last worker, even the last hundred workers that are not doing much for you, in gun production, because we already said guns are capital intensive. So the last time the workers aren't doing much for you, you're still putting them in because they're giving you one extra gun. Maybe you're at war, you need that extra gun. So you're putting in everything into gun production. The first time you decide to give up a gun, which resources are you going to switch over to butter production? The labor resources. Of course, it's, 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 it's the one that's least useful. And lo and behold, when you switch the labor resources, since butter is labor intensive, they add many, many butters. The second time this happens, it's not quite as effective. And the third time, not quite as effective again. Same thing down here. The first time you give up a butter, you switch over the, the machines. They weren't doing much for you anyway. And all of a sudden, you're getting a lot of guns. The second time, it doesn't work so well, because the second time, you get, maybe you have to switch a machine. In the, in the gun production, maybe you have to switch a machine. The second time, maybe you're going to be switching some workers that are more essential. Even though guns are capital intensive, you still need some workers, and so on. So the second time, it's not quite as effective. The third time, it's less effective, and so on. So therefore, it turns out to be a curve, because the first time you get a lot, the second time less, and if you chart out the points, you see it turns out to be this curve. Okay, so that is the production possibility curve, and the principle behind the production possibility curve is that you want to be at full employment. We will see, as we go through the rest of the topics in macroeconomics, this is an important uh, issue to be at full employment. But before we do that, we want to go down to microeconomics uh, sections one, numbers one, two, and three, and probably one, two, and three, and then we'll go back to macroeconomics. Okay, why do we skip the supply and demand analysis? Because it's basic, it's more basic economics. So let's do supply and demand analysis first. Supply and demand analysis is an analysis that tries to explain why the price and quantity ends up where it does. Why the price and quantity ends up where it does. And the reason the price and quantity ends up where it does is, in general, because the buyer comes with his intentions and the seller comes with his intentions, and the two of them meet in the marketplace and their intentions do not coincide. The buyer comes with his intentions, the seller comes with his intentions, they meet in the marketplace and their intentions do not coincide. But they look for a place they can agree upon. And whatever place they can agree upon, that's the place that the market will clear. So here's what we're going to do in supply and demand analysis. We're going to look at the buyer's intentions, then we're going to look at the seller's intentions, then we're going to put the two sets of intentions together, and we're going to see where the market 
where the market clears. Okay. So, the buyer's intentions demand. Buyer's intentions demand. Price quantity, one, two, three, four, five, ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Draw the curve. Price quantity, ten, nine, eight, seven, six. So the buyer says as follows, if you charge me a dollar, I will be willing to purchase ten. If you charge me two dollars, I'll be willing to purchase nine. If you charge me three dollars, I'll be willing to purchase eight, and so on. As you can see, the price and quantity are going in opposite directions of each other. When the price goes up, the quantity he's willing to purchase goes down. When the price goes down, the quantity he's willing to purchase goes up. You see that clearly. In other words, as far as the buyer's intentions are concerned, he is exhibiting the fact that there is going to be an inverse relationship between price and quantity. In other words, as far as he's concerned, price and quantity are moving in opposite directions of each other. When price goes up, quantity he is willing to purchase goes down. When price goes down, the quantity he is willing to purchase goes up. He's showing you that there's an inverse relationship between price and quantity. That's what he's saying. He's saying there's an inverse. This is called the law of the downward sloping demand curve. The demand curve, because there's this inverse relationship between price and quantity, the demand curve is downward sloping. What do we mean by downward sloping? What we mean by downward sloping is that the demand curve has a negative slope. What is slope? The slope of this curve is the change in the y-axis over the change in the x-axis. In this case, it's the change in P over the change in Q. Right? Change in the y over the change in the x. Change in P over the change in Q. That's the slope. The slope of this line is, this is a line, it happens to be a line, it doesn't have to be a line, it could be some sort of curve. The slope of this curve is downward sloping, negative. We mean by downward sloping, negative. The slope of this curve is negative. Why is the slope of this curve negative? Because when price is going up, quantity is going to be going down. When price is going down, quantity is going to be going up. And therefore, it's either plus over minus or minus over plus gives you a negative value. It's always going to be plus over minus or minus over plus. The change in P is positive, the change in Q is negative. The change in P is negative, the change in Q is positive. So it's either plus over minus or minus over plus, so it's going to give you a negative. And the reason why it's always going to be, give you a negative is because when price goes up, quantity goes down. Okay, so price and quantity are inversely related to each other. Now, the next question is, why is it the case, and this is what we have to talk about, why is there this inverse relationship between price and quantity? How come, how come the buyer says, if you charge me more, I'm willing to buy less, and if you charge me less, I'm willing to buy more? And the answer is three reasons. Reason number one. Reason number one is a substitution effect. Reason number one is a substitution effect. Substitution effect means as follows. If the price of this item goes up, I will switch over to its substitute. Every good has a substitute. There's no good that doesn't have any substitutes. Um, sometimes the substitutes are better, sometimes they're worse, but there are some substitutes. So, substitute means there's something else you can use, like, um, you know, apples and pears are substitutes for each other. Something else you can use. Okay. So, let's say we're talking about apples. I'm an apple grower. When the price of apples goes up, <coughs> people will switch a little bit over to pears. When the price of apples goes down, 
people will switch a little bit over from pears to apples. That's why when the price goes up, they buy fewer apples. When the price goes down, they buy more. Substitution effect. Second reason, an income effect. An income effect says as follows. When the price of something I buy goes up, I am, in effect, a poorer person. In effect, I'm a poorer person. Uh, this is best illustrated with something I buy all the time. But even if it's something I don't buy all the time, I'm still a poorer person. In other words, even if it's something I buy once in a while. If it's costing me more, it's as if I got that much of a cut in salary. Let's say, you know, I buy uh, whatever it is. I take a haircut once a month, right? And haircuts go up by a dollar, a dollar a haircut. So I'm twelve dollars poorer for this year. Twelve dollars poorer for this year. Twelve dollars less to play around, right? So when the price of something I buy goes up, I'm a poorer person. Poorer people buy less of everything. One of the things they buy less of is the good that we're talking. One of the things they buy less of is the good that we're talking about, and obviously the effect will be greater depending on you know the circumstance. For some things it won't make a difference, for some things it make more of it. Okay, so that's the second reason why when the price goes up, the quantity goes down as far as the buyer is concerned. Third reason is diminishing margin utility, which you see is this uh, second. Um, second uh, uh, topic here, diminishing margin utility. Diminishing margin utility says as follows. Diminishing margin utility says as follows. Every good gives me a certain amount of satisfaction. But each unit of the good doesn't give me the same satisfaction as each other unit. In other words, Coca-Cola gives me a certain satisfaction. But every glass of Coca-Cola doesn't give me the same satisfaction. In fact, it is the case that the first unit will give me the most satisfaction, the second unit will give me less satisfaction, the third unit will give me less satisfaction, and so on. In other words, every additional unit of a good I consume gives me less satisfaction than the previous unit, less utility diminishing marginal utility. The extra utility I get from an extra unit diminishes. Okay. Why is this so? So the best reason for this is, the best reason for this is the fact that a good can be used for different uses. I always give the example of a glass of water. A glass of water can be used to drink. A glass of water can be used to wash your hands. A glass of water can be used to wash your clothes. A glass of water can be used to wash the floor. If you only had one glass of water, what would you do with it? You would use it to drink. And if you had a second glass of water, what would you do with it? You'd use it to wash your hands. And if you got a third glass of water, what would you do with it? You'd use it to wash your clothes. So why does the first glass of water, why do you use the first glass of water to drink? Because it's the most important thing for you from water. Water is the most important thing that water can do for you, drinking. And why do you use the second one to wash your hands? Because it's the second most important thing. So why does the first one give you the most satisfaction? The first one gives you the most satisfaction because you are putting the first one to its most important use. It's you who makes the first one most important and the second one less important and the third one less important. It's you who does that by putting the first one to its most important use and the, <coughs> and the second one to its secondary use. Uh, you are the one who's making the first one give you the most satisfaction. Okay, so that's the law of diminishing margin utility. Now that we understand the law of diminishing margin utility, what does this have to do 
with when the price goes up, I buy less, and when the price goes down, I buy more. What it has to do is as follows. If I go into the store and I see something is for sale, whatever it is, apples, I have to decide whether to buy the apples. And if I decide to buy the apples, I have to decide how many to buy. Right? That's what I have to decide. So let's say I go into the store and I say, I see apples are for sale for a uh, dollar a pound. Apples are for sale for a dollar a pound. So I have to decide whether to buy the apples and how many apples to buy. So I say to myself like this, am I going to buy the first pound of apples? And if the answer is in the affirmative, the reason I'm going to buy the first pound of apples is because that pound of apples is worth to me a dollar. Maybe the first pound of apples is worth to me two dollars. And they're only charging me a dollar, so I'll buy it. So now I have to decide whether to buy the second pound of apples. So I say to myself like this, listen, the first pound of apples is worth to me two dollars and I bought it, because they're only charging me a dollar. But the second pound of apples is worth to me only a dollar fifty. Ah, but that's okay, because they're only charging me a dollar. I'll buy that one too. Now the third pound of apples is worth to me a dollar, but they're charging me a dollar, so that's okay also. But the fourth pound of apples is only worth to me 75 cents. And they charge me a dollar, I'm not going to buy it. But if they reduce the price to 75 cents, then the fourth pound of apples comes worth it. So I buy that one too. That's the point. Point is, as they reduce the price, the reduction in the price catches up to the diminishing utility. And if they wouldn't reduce the price, if they raise the price, then I buy fewer. Because let's say they raise the price to $1.50. I'm not going to buy the third pound of apples. I'm only going to buy the second pound of apples, because the third pound of apples is worth a dollar, and the second pound of apples is worth a dollar fifty. And they charge me a dollar fifty, I'll buy that one, but I won't buy the third one, because they're charging me a dollar fifty, I'm only getting a dollar's worth of utility out of the third pound, like we said. So the point is, as they reduce the price, it catches up to the diminishing utility. As they raise the price, I buy fewer because it 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 interferes with my utility. Okay. So that's how the law of diminishing margin utility explains why when the price goes down, I buy more, and the price goes up, I buy less. Okay, so that's the demand part of the question. That's the demand part of the question. Okay, now while we're talking about this, we might as well talk about number 1B, which says substitutes and complements. Number 1B, which says substitutes and complements. The issue of substitutes and complements is as follows. As you can see, the price of an item, as you can see, the price of an item affects how many I'm going to buy. The substitutes and complements here is telling us that not only does the price of the item itself affect how many I'm going to buy, the price of a good substitutes and complements also affects how many I'm going to buy. The price of a good substitutes and complements also affects how many. What are the substitutes? Substitutes we already explained. Goods that you can substitute for this good. What are complements? Complements are goods that are used together with a good. Complements are goods that are used together with a good. In other words, Cars and gasoline are complements of, to each, of each other because, you know, you can't run a car without gasoline and gasoline is useless without a car. Hardware and software are complements of each other. You can't run a computer without software. I mean, technically you can, but you're not going to do it. You can't run a computer without software and software is useless without a computer, so they're complements of each other. So the prices of substitutes and complements affect affect the good itself. So for example, um, substitutes. The price, let's say I'm talking about apples. The price of pears will affect how many apples I buy. Because if pears go up in price, I'm going to switch over from pears to apples, so I'm going to buy more apples. If pears go down in price, I'm going to switch over from apples to pears and buy less. So, so the price of the substitute, when the price of the substitute goes up, I buy more of the good, and when the price of the substitute goes down, I buy less of it. 
Okay, that's substitutes. Complements. Complements works in the opposite direction. When the price of gasoline goes up, I'm going to buy less cars. When the price of gasoline goes down, I'm going to buy more cars. With the substitute, when the price goes up, right, I buy more. When the price goes down, I buy less. With the complement, when the price goes up, I buy less. When the price goes down, I buy more. Why when the complement, it works like that? Because when the complement goes up in price, it's as if the good went up in price. Same thing as if the good goes up in price. And good goes up in price, you see, you buy less of it. So the price of the complement, the price of software goes up, people buy less computers. The price of software goes down, people buy more computers. That's substitutes of confidence. Let us go on to the supply curve. Let's go on to the supply curve. So, so far we have the point of view of the buyer. Now we will turn to the point of view of the seller, which is supply. Price quantity, one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Supply, price, quantity. Supply is upward sloping, meaning that if you pay me more, I will give you more. I will produce more for you. <coughs> if you pay me more, I will produce more for you. So that's what it says. If you pay me a dollar, I'll give you six. If you pay me two dollars, I'll give you seven. If you pay me I'll give you eight. As you pay me more, I give you more. Now, what it's really saying, if you think about it, what it's really saying is, if you don't pay me more, I will not give you more. That's what it's really saying. It's really saying, if you pay me a dollar, I'll give you six, but I won't give you the seventh until you pay me two dollars. I won't give you the seventh until you pay me two dollars. Now the question arises, why not? Why won't you give me the seventh until, uh, unless you pay me two dollars? After all, <coughs> when I was when I was paying you a dollar, you were producing six for me, you must have been making a profit. And I'm saying to you, give me a seventh one and make a little bit more profit. What's wrong with that? Give me another one and make a little bit more profit. What's wrong with that? The answer, the only answer, in other words, why doesn't he want to produce that seventh one unless they pay him more? And the answer has to be because his costs are rising. The answer has to be that as, as he produces more, his costs per, per unit are going up. And therefore, if you don't pay him more, you can't make a profit. That's the only way out. In other words, as production goes up, costs go up per unit. And now we have to explain why costs go up per unit. The main reason why costs go up per unit is because of the law of diminishing returns. The main reason why costs go up per unit is because of the law of diminishing returns. <coughs> and here's the example for the law of diminishing returns. The example for the law of diminishing returns is you have a field, you have a worker on the field, and he produces 100 units, 100 bushels. You get a second worker on the field. Together they produce 190 bushels. <coughs> now the first worker you paid $100. The second worker you paid $100. The first worker gave you 100, it was a dollar a bushel. The second worker only added 90. It's more than a dollar per bushel. So of course it's going. Second worker. Now, it's not the case, I must emphasize the fact, <coughs> it's not the case <coughs> the second worker is actually giving you only 90 bushels. It's once they're there together, each one is only producing 95. Once they're there together, each one is only producing 95. 
Why? Because when there was one worker on the field, he had the whole field to work with. When you have two workers on the field, each of them only has half the field to work with. You can't expect someone who has a half a field to produce as much as someone who has a whole field. A similar, a similar uh, another example of this, another example of this would be, another example of this, Another example of this would be um, you have a you have a uh, <clears throat> another example of this would be you have you have a worker and he has a desk you have a worker he has a desk and you give him a computer and now you get a second worker and the second worker you also give him a desk and a computer. But the first, when you had the first worker there, he needed a printer, so you gave him a printer. And when you got the second worker, you gave him a desk and a computer, but you didn't give him a printer. You said you could share the printer. What's the problem? You could share the printer. The computer you need all the time. That's okay. But you could share the printer. But the problem is that production is going to be slowed down a little bit. Because now they're sharing the printer. And there will be some times when they both need this printer at the same time. So that's going to slow down production. So here's the law. So that's the same. It's the same thing. You can't expect someone who has the whole printer to work with, the guy who has only half the printer to work with, has to share the printer, to produce as much as the guy who has the whole printer to work with. Same, same principle. So the law of diminishing returns works in the following, on the following basis. The law of diminishing returns works in the following basis. Law of diminishing returns says if you have a fixed factor and a variable factor, and you add to the fixed factor. You have a fixed factor and a variable factor. The fixed factor in the case that I gave you was the field. The variable factor is the workers. You have a fixed factor and a variable factor. And you increase the variable factor. You will get an increase in production, but at a decreasing rate. And that's going to mean increasing. In other words, you do get an increase in production. Like I said, when you had two workers on the field, you got 190 bushels. But the second worker produced less than the first one. You're going to get an increase in production at a decreasing rate. And therefore, you're going to get diminishing returns. OK. So diminishing returns means increase in costs. His costs are going up. And if his costs are going up, he has to charge you more. Now we just have to talk a little bit more about this diminishing returns principle. Just have to talk a little bit more about this diminishing returns principle. First of all, diminishing returns doesn't necessarily set in right away. You need this for some stuff we have later on. Diminishing returns doesn't necessarily set in right away. If you, uh, I gave you the example of a field. You have a field and a worker on the field, and then you get a second worker. What if you have this huge field and you can stick one worker in his corner and a second worker in his corner? You're not going to get diminishing returns. And even if you get a third or a fourth worker or a fifth worker, you give him his only little piece. But eventually, the field is going to be picked up, filled up, and you're going to reach the point of diminishing returns. There's going to be a point of diminishing returns. Before the point of diminishing returns, costs might be going down, but beyond the point of diminishing returns, costs will start to go up. Okay. The next question you have to ask is, I said that you get diminishing returns, and that causes costs to go up. But diminishing returns depends on the fact that you have a fixed factor. The only reason behind diminishing returns is you have a fixed factor. One of the factors has to be fixed. Like I said, the whole reason behind diminishing returns is because he had the whole field to work with, now he only has half the field to work with. So some factor has to be fixed. How do you know you're going to get diminishing returns? How do you know that when you increase production, you're going to keep some factor fixed? And the answer to that question is, that's what companies normally do. If you have a baker, for example, of a baker, and the baker, and the baker experiences a increase in demand for his goods. Increase in demand for his goods. What is he going to do? Is he going to get a whole new oven and a whole new crew? What he's going to do is going to add a few workers. He's going to keep the oven fixed, so he's going to experience diminishing returns. Why does he do it that way? He does it that way for a very simple reason. 
because if you added a whole a whole oven and a whole crew, what if what if tomorrow morning demand drops down again? He's never sure it's going to be wherever it was. He's never sure that it's going to be maintained at the higher level. How does he know? So he's going to do something that he can reverse easily. He's going to keep one. He's going to keep one thing fixed and just add workers. So that's one reason why you always have diminishing returns, because that's what businesses do normally. The second reason why you always have diminishing returns is because you are fixed. Your managerial ability is fixed, just like the case of the printer. In other words, if you have one worker, you manage one worker. If you have two workers, you have to manage two workers. Sometimes you have to manage them at the same time, and that will slow down production. Okay, so that is, so the supply curve is upward sloping. Okay. So you see that you, you have the buyer and the seller, and the buyer comes with his intentions, the seller comes with his intentions, and as you can see, the two sets of intentions do not coincide. The two sets of intentions do not coincide, correct? They don't coincide. They don't coincide. But, there's going to be one point, there may be one point, not necessarily, but if there is one point they can agree upon, if there is one point they can agree upon, that's where the market is going to be. And indeed, in this case, there is, the whole, the whole set of intentions doesn't coincide, but there is one point they can agree upon, 3 and 8, and that's where the market is going to be. There is one point that's on both the supply curve and the demand curve. And that's where the market is going to be. There's one point that's on both the supply and the demand curve, and that's where the market is going to be. Okay. Now, let us prove that th this point is called the equilibrium point. This point is called the equilibrium point, and it's the point where <clears throat> if you start out at any other point, it's going to be forced to the equilibrium point. And if, when it reaches the equilibrium point, it stops moving. We're going to prove that if it starts out at any other point, it's going to be forced to the equilibrium. We're going to prove it. Here's the way we prove it. We say as follows. Let's say the price starts out above the equilibrium. Five. Right? The price starts at five. At five, he comes, supplier, comes to the market with ten bushels. See? And he sells only six. There is, right, a surplus. He says, I came with 10 bushels, I sold only 6. That's no good. Tomorrow I better come with 9 bushels. And I'll reduce the price to 4. But the next day he comes with 9 bushels at $4 and he sells only 7. It's still a surplus. The next day he comes with 8 bushels at 3 and he sells them. The market stops him. Same thing. I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Okay. Uh, same thing. Uh, if the market starts out, we drew this actually wrong. It should have been coming down. Okay. Same thing if the market starts out below the equilibrium point. The market starts out at one. The market starts out at one. At one, he comes with six bushels. But people want ten. He comes with six and people want ten. There's a shortage. The price starts out below the equilibrium point, there's a shortage. There's a shortage. He sells out all six bushels. He sells out all six bushels. And people are still coming into the store. So he says, tomorrow I'll come with more. So the next day he comes with seven and charges two dollars. But people want nine, there's still a shortage. So the next day he comes with eight and three dollars in the market. 
So if the price starts out above the equilibrium point, there's going to be a surplus, and the price is going to be forced down to the equilibrium point. If the price starts out below the equilibrium point, the price is going to be forced up to the equilibrium. That's 1A, shortage and surplus. Okay, we're moving along very slowly, I know, I know but it's the best I could do. Okay, let's just do number three, so we'll get rid of it. And maybe even number four, so we'll get rid of that. And then we'll go on to the other stuff. Okay, let's do, in microeconomics, we'll do number three and number four, elasticity and incidence of the tax. And then we'll go back to macroeconomics. Elasticity. What is elasticity? Here we're talking about, let us redraw this. We're finished with supply and demand, and it, it essentially, I mean, not, not completely finished, but in terms of what we're talking about. We're finished with uh, supply and demand equilibrium, and now we're concentrating on the demand curve. Price quantity, one, two, three, four, let's say 10, nine, eight, seven whatever it was, right? Now, elasticity of demand is a measure of how, to what degree the quantity responds to changes in price. How much does quantity respond to changes in price? In other words, we know that when the price goes down, the quantity goes up. Elasticity of demand asks the question, how much does the price go up? I mean, how much does the quantity go up? Yes, when the price changes, the quantity changes. But by how much? Does it change a lot? Does it change a little bit? That's elasticity. It's important for a producer to know when the price changes, how much his quantity is going to change. And the reason why it's important for him to know that is because price times quantity equals revenue. He has to know what his revenue is. Even though his revenue is totally profit, it reflects profit. Revenue is the gross. <clears throat> price times quantity equals revenue. So when price goes up, quantity goes down. But if the quantity only goes down a little bit, he'll make money. If the price goes up, the quantity goes down. But if the quantity only goes down a little bit, he'll still make more money. Now on the other hand, when the price goes up, quantity goes down a lot, will make less money. And the opposite direction as well. When the price goes down, the quantity will go up. In other words, I reduce the price, I'll sell more. But if I only sell a little bit more, I'm not going to gain anything. If I sell a lot more, I'm going to gain. That's the question of elasticity of demand. Elasticity of demand is measured as the percentage change in quantity over the percentage change in price. Percentage change in quantity over the percentage change in price. If the percentage change in quantity is greater than the percentage change in price, this is going to be greater than one. In other words, if quantity is going is changing more than price does, it's called elastic, and that's greater than one. If the percentage change in quantity is less than the percentage change in price, it's called inelastic. And if the percentage change in quantity is equal to the percentage change in price, it's called unitary elasticity. So that's the question of elasticity. It's just a thing that we like to know because it's important for the revenue. Also, under certain circumstances, it's even important for profits. And I'll give you an example where it's even important for profits. Let's say when, when a company can control the price, not only can control the price, but the revenue is pure profit. The revenue is pure profit. I'll give you the case in which that is. The subway fares, the, the bus fares, the transit fares. Whenever they raise the fare, they have to know how many riders they're going to lose. 
So if you're going to lose a lot of riders, they're going to lose money. It's useless. But if they're only going to lose a few riders, then it's useful to raise the fare because they'll make money. So that's the question. The question is, does quantity change a lot? Does quantity change a little bit? If quantity changes a lot, in other words, they raise the fare 10%, they're going to lose 20% of the riders, they're going to lose money. It doesn't make sense to change the fare by 10%. But if 10% rise in the price only loses 1% of the riders, it makes sense. So that's the question of elasticity. If in the case of the subway fare, apparently, because they're changing, they're raising the price, and they're not afraid to lose money, apparently they believe it's inelastic, which means when they raise the price, the quantity is going to go down very little. So they believe it is inelastic. OK, let's take a look at the incidence of a tax. The incidence of a tax. This is probably also quick. Okay, the incidence of a tax is the question of on whose, on whom a sales tax will, on, on whom a sales tax will, uh, uh, will be, be born, on, on which on the buyer or the seller. In other words, will the buyer pay the sales tax or will the seller pay the sales tax? In other words, you impose a sales tax on goods. Who's going to pay the sales tax? Will the buyer end up paying the sales tax? Or will the seller be able to shift the sales tax to the buyer? So here's the way we analyze it. Here's the way we analyze it. Whenever a sales tax is imposed, what happens is that the supply curve shifts up by the amount of the sales tax. The supply curve shifts up by the amount of the sales tax. It means as follows. It means as follows. You see, I was willing to give you this many for this price, but now there's a dollar tax. So you have to pay me a dollar more so I can get the same amount I was getting before. In other words, let's say I was willing to give you 12 for five dollars. And that is a dollar tax, so you have to pay me 13 dollars so that I get 12 dollars. You understand? Every time, whatever I was willing to get before, you have to pay me a dollar more. You always have to pay me a dollar more than you were paying before so that I get whatever I was getting before. <clears throat> so that's, that's what that's what happens to the supply curve when the sales tax is imposed. Okay. So a sales tax is going to shift the supply curve up by the amount of the tax, by the exact amount of the tax. Now, notice what happens to the equilibrium price when this happens. Before the equilibrium price was here, and now the equilibrium price is here. The sales tax was this much. The sales tax was the dollar. Now you'll notice that the equilibrium price goes up less than a dollar. You'll notice that the equilibrium price goes up less than a dollar indicates to us that sales tax is going to be shared by the buyer and the seller. In other words, the sales tax is a dollar. The equilibrium price only went up, let's say, 40 cents. So apparently, the buyer pays 40 cents more, and the seller absorbs 60 cents of the sales tax. OK, so that's incidence of the tax. Let's take a couple of minute break. We'll go back to macroeconomics.